A three-month investigation leads to the dismantling of a sophisticated auto theft ring. We're going to have more on the results of Project Ninja coming up tonight. And scary moments in a Markham parking garage. Two suspects try to carjack a woman. Plus, the GTA condo market is oversupplied, and it'll likely take a while to balance out. We're going to take a look at the results of a new report. Who to tip and how much Canadians are not comfortable with the increasing request to tip. This is according to a new survey. You're watching Live at 5. Good evening. I'm Bakari Savage. And I'm Lena Latifat. Thanks so much for joining us. Will Ferrell is set to walk the red carpet at TIFF for the international premiere of Will and Harper. It's a documentary about him and his friend. And TV 24's G. Young Lee joins us live from Roy Thompson Hall. G. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Lena. Good afternoon, Bakari. We are standing by waiting for Will Farrell and his friend Harper Steele. Right now, uh, we've got director Josh Greenbaum here taking some photos. I'll let Tristan get in my spot so he can show you that. Uh, we're just waiting for Will and Harper Steele as well. This is a beautiful documentary showcasing their friendship as they go on a 16-day journey which starts in New York and along the way meeting up with some friends like old pals like SNL alumni uh, Seth Meyers and Tina Fey. Uh, basically Will Ferrell and Harper Steele have been friends for 30 years um, and then at some point in their friendship Harper has come out as a trans woman and this 16 day journey is really just documenting their friendship self-discovery and really living life as your authentic self uh, it's a heartwarming documentary it is having its international premiere uh, we're just standing by um, what's really fun is that in the fan zone fans are obviously waiting for Will Ferrell there's a gentleman there dressed as Buddy the Elf hoping to meet um, uh, Will Ferrell himself and then they were also giving out these um, drink cozies and they basically look like yellow parkas which you actually see in the documentary so again everyone waiting for the man himself will Farrell as you know he's had hit after hit on the big screen we're talking Eurovision anchorman and of course elf being a holiday classic uh, so we are standing by and of course we hope to interview the director and the stars of this documentary as soon as they arrive in the meantime we'll send it back to you all right Gian Lee live on the red carpet thanks to well, TIFF is defending its decision to screen a controversial documentary about Russian soldiers at the festival. Russians at War follows a Russian army battalion that's fighting in Ukraine. It's been met with backlash from members of the Ukrainian community who have called for it to be pulled. Ukraine's consul general says it attempts to absolve Russian soldiers of personal responsibility. TIFF says it respects concerns about the film, but that it was made without the participation of the Russian government and should in no way be considered propaganda. We uh, saw this film, Russians at War, um, many weeks ago, and uh, before it made its premiere at the Venice Film Festival a couple of weeks ago, um, we also invited it. We feel it's an important um, uh, look at what's going on on the ground. Um, this is a Russian-Canadian filmmaker, um, and she has uh, gotten access to uh, some soldiers who are fighting there and who are really confused and disillusioned by having to fight there, who don't want to be there, who want this war to end desperately. Uh, and we felt that was an important context uh, for the film. And the film will make it to North America and premiere later this week as scheduled. Well, in other news, Halton police say they've disrupted a major auto theft ring that was based in Quebec but stealing vehicles here in the GTA. Four people have been charged and Canada-wide warrants have been issued for four others in relation to a criminal organization. Investigators say that the suspects would come to the GTA steal high-end vehicles and then ship them out of the country via the Port of Montreal. The work completed as part of Project Ninda is a testament to our mission to di disrupt organized crime, a mission shared throughout the organization. To this end, we are devoting even more extensive resources to achieving this priority goal, and we will not stop until the criminals do. We are and will continue to respond to incidents using every tool and technique available to us. We have to really encourage 
uh, the province, through the, the ministry and the crowns and the judges to really take this more seriously. I know my residents do in this community and this board and I as a councillor, we hear about this every single day. It is simply, um, it is simply just so in the face of everybody in this community. Everybody here in Halton Region knows somebody who has had a car stolen. Uh, police say a unique method was used to transport the stolen vehicles to Montreal. They were put in a modified RV trailer. This is what you're looking at right here. It looked like a regular camper from the outside as it was towed along the 401 to Quebec. This is definitely something um, new to us. We've never seen anything like this before. And obviously criminals are, are getting more and more creative mm -hmm. uh, with their crafts and, and trying to avoid police detection. We know that stolen vehicles go to the port of Montreal and typically they do so in, in shipping containers. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a new creative idea where the suspects were, were driving these vehicles into the RV and then the RV pulled them on the 401 to uh, the port of Montreal where they were shipped overseas. At least 40 vehicles were stolen, but only about a dozen have been recovered. Well, police have released footage of two suspects try to carjack a woman in a marking, Markham parking garage. Investigators say August 31st, around 8 o'clock that evening, the woman pulled into a parking garage in the area of Enterprise Boulevard in Birchmount Road. She was driving a silver Mercedes SUV and was followed by a white Honda Civic. Well, the suspects pulled into the space right beside her. They got out and demanded her keys. A struggle took place. Eventually, the suspects left without her car. The first suspect is described as male, black, with a thin build. Suspect number two is described as male, dark skin, with curly hair and a tattoo on his right forearm. Time now is 5.06, 23 degrees, feeling more like 24 out there. Let's get a check on that. Drive home with our traffic specialist, Adjua and C.A. Abouab. Good evening. Oh, good evening, Lena Bakari. And it continues to be quite the struggle to get home. We have some big issues slowing down the drive into Mississauga. So watching this multi-vehicle collision, it's on the 403 westbound. It's on the approach to Mavis. Now the HOV, as well as the two left lanes out with this collision. So drive not the easiest one. Already seeing quite the slowdown pretty much right on off the 401 down towards that situation. Also, brand new problems coming into the traffic desk. This is on the QBW Toronto bound, uh, just as you make your way past Mississauga Road. Find the left lane out with the collision and also problems longstanding. This is on the 401 westbound in the collector through Islington. Now it looks like it is uh, the left lane and shoulder that remains blocked to this collision. Also, major, major delays they do extend from before Victoria Park. On City Street, just a heads up. Cruise on scene of a collision blocking lanes on Young and Finch. I'll send it back to you. This CP24 traffic report is brought to you by 407 ETR. Enjoy the journey with a stress-free commute. Well, fewer children in the province are enrolling in autism therapy despite a growing wait list. And Premier Doug Ford was asked about that gap today. All right now, let's go live to CP24. It's Andrew Brennan, who's at Queen's Park. Andrew. Yeah, Bakari, Lena, just before we get to the answer that uh, the Premier gave to the question that we posed to him this morning, uh, wanting to give a little bit of context here. When we're talking about tens of thousands more names on the waiting list than were there back uh, before the uh, Ford government took power, there's also looking at how many are, for instance, aging out of the system or the reductions that are being seen in some weeks, according to some data that's been unveiled. So we have, at least for a small section of this summer, you're seeing a wait list growing by almost 500 names, but in terms of the actual number of children in this province that are receiving government-funded therapies that are on the autism spectrum, well, there's, there was an, an actual reduction of about 70 or so names on the actual funded list. So the ministry says that could be they are aging out or otherwise. But in terms of the overall number, it is staggering. Take a listen to not only hear from the, the president of the, of the Autism Coalition of Ontario, but also from the Premier. We're going to continue investing into uh, the autism uh, sector and, and working with families. It's very challenging for these parents. I've talked to many, many of them, uh, but we've increased funding to a staggering amount. We'll continue investing uh, in the system. What we're seeing is the rate of children coming off the wait list has slowed. Um, at some points uh, in those two week periods that they were reporting, the numbers were actually negative. Um, it's very concerning. And as of right now, approximately 14,000 of the 73,000 children registered have access to core clinical services funding. 
So seeing there, 14,000 children are getting government-assisted therapies, funded therapies, uh, and also looking at about 73,000 overall that are on a list waiting to be able to ultimately get a chance to be able to get this needed therapy. There's also a time crunch here. Let's not forget that, Lena Bakari, because when we talk about how long the wait is, and this is incredibly important for people that are going through early stages of development and also needing behavioral, uh, behavioral analysis as well, you're talking about a wait list that, even though there's no official number from the government, could be potentially six, seven years, if not longer. I'll send it back to you. All right, Andrew Brennan live at Queen's Park tonight. Andrew, thanks so much. It is now 510, 23 degrees. You're watching Live at 5. And coming up, a new survey finds that Canadians are not comfortable with the increasing requests for tips. We're going to have reaction from Toronto residents next. Welcome back. The TTC is phasing out some station entry gates. This is in a bid to crack down on fare evasion. The gates that don't require a presso tap, they're for those with young children, those using uh, paper transfer or cash. But the transit agency says that it also makes it easier for Dodgers to get by. TTC staff at stations on the Shepherd Line are now setting the fare gates to tap-only mode. The policy will eventually be rolled out across the system. Those who usually use the gates will need to have their fare validated by staff who will then manually let them in. Well, the province is investing $26 million in a new skilled trades training center in Vaughan. The project is in partnership with the Laborers International Union of North America. It'll provide training for nearly 50,000 additional workers, doubling their current capacity. They'll be trained for in-demand careers like bricklaying, heavy equipment, operation, and concrete finishing. This facility, this campus, is just absolutely amazing. And I'm told it's the largest skilled trades campus in all of Canada. And that you can actually build a full-size, two-story residential home here, just like the one behind me from start to finish. That's absolutely incredible. Better training, better jobs with bigger paychecks. That is what we are on a mission to do. And why are we doing it? Well, in Ontario alone, we have 190 billion reasons. That is our investment in subways, largest investment in Ontario's history. That is our investment in highways and critical infrastructure. You heard uh, Joe and Jack mention it, from Bradford Bypass to Highway 413. We have to get it right. But this infrastructure, the 50-plus hospitals under construction, the schools under construction, new nuclear, power, powering a better tomorrow. None of that just appears because we wish it to appear. It appears because men and women get up each and every day to make it happen, to build a better Ontario. Well, the province says that the training facility will also help with their goal of building hundreds of thousands of new homes. Well, uh, Canadians are uncomfortable with the increasing request for tips. That is all according to a new survey. Okay, for more, let's go live to CP24's Kayla Williams. Kayla, you've been talking to a lot of Torontonians about their attitudes when it comes to leaving gratuity. I've worked in a place where I had to, you know, rely on tips. Mm -hmm. Lena has as well. You mm -hmm. were a server as well, right? Yeah, that's right. Halfway through my university years. So absolutely know what it's like to work in the service industry. But this was a pretty interesting survey and the results, I should say, done by the narrative research. And essentially it showed that 77% of Canadians do agree that, yes, if you are going to go to an establishment, a restaurant, a patio, like where we are here in Liberty Village this afternoon, then you absolutely should tip. However, it's other services that we're talking about, uh, which deems the question at... Is it appropriate to tip? And come to find out with this survey that just 19% of Canadians feel that they should have to tip when it comes to getting takeout at a fast food joint or perhaps grabbing a coffee. Now, other uh, results from this uh, survey shows that Salons, about 60% of Canadians feel that, yes, you should tip if you're getting your hair or your nails done. Hotel housekeeping came in at 49% and taxi cabs at 48 But here at Liberty Village, I spoke to some folks about the tipping culture here in the city, and here's what they had to say. It should, there should be an option where it says uh, no tipping. Like, an option to tip if you want. I, again, I'm all for tipping, mm -hmm. right? You can tip, but if you don't want, you should have an option. Plain and simple. I probably would be, oh, I'm so sorry, be more inclined 
to tip even if I am do, just because of COVID and everything I just feel if I, if we're privileged enough to be able to do it but I, I don't think everybody has that as long as it's a job well done and they got a nice attitude I mean don't be a jerk you know you got to earn it a little bit all right, so when it comes to dining out, when you do tip and the machine is presented to you, Lena and Bakari, most times nowadays, you'll see that it prompts you starting at 18%, ranging upwards of 25 or even more. This survey shows that 53% of Canadians are still tipping at 15%, and they feel that that is an appropriate amount. As far as that 18 to 20% mark, just 11% of folks are tipping at that percentage, and even 17% of Canadians, well, they're tipping at five percent back to you well wow. kayla i do have to issue a correction you and i were the only ones who had to work for dibs <laughs> oh lena only worked in oh. an establishment where there was tipping she you know, didn't rely upon tips. I, yeah I, i've never experienced it but i have yeah. been on the other end where you're a patron and it's awkward right the person's looking at you you've got all the options in front of you and you just don't know what to do it's um yeah, it's awkward. It can be. Kayla, yeah, thanks so yeah. much for this. It's 517, 22 degrees. You're this is Live at 5. Well, coming up next, we'll have a reaction to the first presidential debate between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. Stay with us. Thank you. Welcome to you both. It's wonderful to have you. It's an honor to have you both here tonight. Welcome back. Reaction continues tonight to last night's U.S. presidential debate. Kamala Harris. Let's have a good debate. Nice to see you. Have fun. Thank you. Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump took the stage in Philadelphia. You can see it right there. It's seen as offering Americans their most detailed look at the campaign. The event showcased their starkly different visions for the country on abortion and immigration. Harris pushed the former president on his record and baited him into tirades. Will she allow abortion in the eighth month, ninth month, seventh month? Come on. Okay, would you do that? Why don't you ask why, her that question? Why don't you answer That's the, the problem. question? Would you because veto? under Roe v. Wade, the question, you, could, you, veto? you could do abortions in the seventh month, the eighth month, the ninth That's month, and probably after birth. Just look at the governor, former governor of, of Virginia. The governor of Virginia said we put the baby aside and then we determine what we want to do with the baby. President so Taylor Swift is now making it official, endorsing Kamala Harris in the election. The superstar singer finally weighing in and responding to a doctored image of her endorsing Donald Trump that was posted on the former president's social media. In an Instagram post, Swift says the fake picture conjured up her fears around AI and the dangers of spreading misinformation. She went on to endorse Harris, calling her a steady handed, gifted leader. Swift also said she was impressed that Tim Walls has been standing up for LGBTQ plus rights, IVF, and a woman's right to her own body for decades. Swift signed her post, Childless Cat Lady. And American voters will head to the polls to elect their next president November 5th. Staying in the U.S., 9-11 happened 23 years ago today, and a ceremony was held at Ground Zero to remember the victims. David D. Alger. Ernest Alicacos. Edward L. Allegretto. Eric. The names of the thousands killed in the attacks were read aloud. President Biden, Vice yeah. President Harris, and former President Trump were all in attendance, sitting together alongside first responders and families of those killed. And Harris and Trump shook hands and spoke briefly at the 9-11 ceremony this morning as they stood a few feet apart just hours after their debate. And 24 Canadians were among those killed, including Ken Basnicki, who was in the North Tower when the plane struck. His son, Brennan, was just 16 at the time, and he joined us to reflect on his father's legacy. Today, I couldn't, you know, say take the day off, but what am I going to do? I'm going to give blood. And I think that's, you know, a, a message I want to convey today is, so it's, today is Canadian National Day of Service. It's an Ontario uh, Day of Service. You know, for a lot of people, taking a day off and, you know, volunteering is, is a big ask. It's yeah. not a holiday. But there are small things you can do. You can donate blood, you know, buy a cup, of, a cup of coffee, you know, visit a hospital, visit someone in need. Take 20 minutes, take 30 minutes, do something small and, you know, really focus on that positive element, which we really saw in the aftermath of 9-11. And nearly 3,000 people were killed September 11, 2001, when terrorists hijacked four planes, crashing them into the World Trade Center buildings, the Pentagon, and a field in Pennsylvania. It is the deadliest terror attack on American soil. 
It is now 523, 22 degrees. This is Live at 5. Stolen in Ottawa, found in Italy, just ahead, police solved the theft of a famous portrait of Winston Churchill. Well, the mystery around the theft of a really famous portrait of British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill from the lobby of an Ottawa hotel has been solved. Okay, right now we have to talk to CP24's Lindsay Biscay from Raw This Who Done It. Lindsay, this reminds me of the Thomas Crown affair. Yeah, and when it comes to who done it, Bakari, we actually don't know who because the suspect or the man that's been arrested, police say his name is under a publication ban, um, but he is facing a number of charges. But this is a really interesting sequence of events. You might remember this photograph. It's a famous photograph, also known as the Roaring Lion of Winston Churchill, taken by a famous Ottawa photographer, Yusuf Karsh, back in 1941 when Winston Churchill came to visit Canada. Uh, this is up at the at Ottawa's Fairmont Chateau Laurier Hotel. And sometime between the end of 2021 and 2022, it was stolen. And, and hotel staff still don't know exactly when, because you might remember we were in a pandemic. There wasn't as many people in the hotel. It wasn't until later someone realized that a fake had been uh, up in the real photograph's place. And that's when police notified the public that it had been stolen. Ottawa police saying today they've managed to track it down. So they found it in Italy. So they know at this point that a, an auction house in London sold it to a private buyer in Italy. Italy and both the auction house and the private buyer um, did not know that this was a stolen photograph. It was actually sold to this private buyer the day before police announced that it was stolen from the hotel in Ottawa. So really timing here is everything. That's why uh, this real photograph was able to be sold and, you know, why this suspect was able to get away with this for so long. We spoke with a heist expert today about that and, and about the police investigation looking at auction houses around the world. Have a listen. Of course, there's some thieves that specialize in things that aren't quite of enough value to be interesting, but clearly this is a historical item. I mean, we're talking about it right now in the news. And so one of the first places you go is you call the auction houses, and there's only so many. And obviously, Sotheby's is a huge name, but it's international. It's not your local Canadian Sotheby's outlet. It's, you know, one in London. And the auction houses these days do a great job of knowing who the seller and buyer are. They keep that information very uh, secret, but they have it and they share it with the police. So really interesting stuff, Bakari and Lena. We heard from Ottawa police as well today that it was Yusuf Karsh's dream to have this photograph up at the hotel. His wife is still alive. And so to honor uh, those wishes, they are going to bring the photograph back to the hotel now. And of course, as I say, a man is now facing a number of charges, but his name under a publication ban. Back to you. Okay, so mystery solved. If only we could go to Rome to help pick it up. <laughs> oh my goodness, wouldn't that be crazy? <laughs> 528, 22 degrees. This is Live at 5. Fewer children in the province are enrolling in autism therapy despite a growing wait list. I'll tell you what the Premier had to say about it today. That's coming up. A three-month investigation leads to the dismantling of a sophisticated auto theft ring. We're going to have more on the results of Project Ninja coming up. Well, scary moments in a Markham parking garage. Two suspects try to carjack a woman. We'll tell you more. And the GTA condo market is oversupplied. It's going to likely take a while to balance out. We'll take a look at the results of a new report. And who to tip and how much? Canadians say they're uncomfortable with the idea of increasing requests for tips. According to a new survey, we'll have reaction tonight. This is Live at 5. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Lena Latifat. And I'm Bakari Savage. Few children in the province are enrolling in autism therapy. This is despite a growing wait list. Premier Doug Ford was asked about that gap today. For more, let's go live to CB24's Andrew Brennan, who's at Queen's Park tonight. Andrew. Alina Bakari, there's 73,000 in, well, even a little bit more than that, children who are on the list of those trying to seek government-funded therapies as they are under the age of 18, by the way, so all children here, trying to be able to do what can be done to help those on the spectrum to succeed as best as possible in life. There's only 14,000 that are actually receiving government-funded therapies or at least funding from the government, some people having to resort to paying out of pocket. We'll get to that in a second. But then looking at the actual numbers of those that are being enrolled into the program versus those that are 
that are potentially aging out or just the number in total. There was about 500 names added to the wait list in the span of two weeks while 70 names were taken or removed from the funded list. So those that are getting government funding. We asked the forward government and the premier today what he thought about this and we also heard not long ago from the president of the Ontario Autism Coalition about what this means and in terms of what the real wait time is for families that are trying to get help. When we came into office, it was a bankrupt system. There was $200 million. I think it was two weeks into it. They said they had no money. Uh, we've, been, we've increased that over $700 million that we're giving funding. There was over, there was over 8,000 when I first started uh, children uh, with autism. And all, all of a sudden, in five years later, there's, I don't know, I'm, I'm hearing numbers of 60 or 70,000. There isn't a set time, but we know, and there's no indicator given to us by the government, but we know um, as a community, because we've gotten very good at speaking with each other, we're good at figuring out where we're at when it comes to wait times. And right now, when we're talking to people, it's anywhere from five to seven years. And when we're talking about an early developmental window for children, we're completely missing that window with the therapies and the services and the supports that would mean the most to them. Meaning time is of the essence. Now, you did hear the Premier say $700 million. Well, the budget this year from the PC government is $720 million for this government-funded therapy. That being said, that is double what it was under the prior Liberal government. At the same time, the wait list during the Liberal government, Lena Bakari, was about 23,000 kids waiting for government funding for therapy. And there was 10,000 that were actually in the program. Compare that to now, 73,000 and 14,000. I'll send it back to you. Live at Queen's Park, CP24, and... Andrew Brennan. Andrew, thank you very much. Right now it's 534, 22 degrees. Let's get a check on the commute. CP24 traffic specialist, Adjoa Nsiyabwa. Adj. Yeah, it continues to be uh, quite the slow go out there on the major routes and been watching this ongoing problem in Mississauga on the westbound 403. It's on the approach to Mavis. It's the HOV as well as the two left lanes that are out following this collision. So again, creating quite the slowdown as you make your way from the 401. Headed towards at the 401, uh, problems are happening on the westbound of 401. This is right at Dufferin. It looks like now just the center lane. It was the two center at one point, just blocked with this uh, stalled vehicle. We had reports of problems on the eastbound lanes of the 401. It just might be just east of this camera. Just going to check. But if you're eastbound on the 401, you can see a cop car making its way through. So east of Port Unit, it appears you might be dealing with a collision in the right lane. Problems on the northbound DVP is, is a collision just as you make your way on the approach to Don Mills. Center lane is out. The other vehicle took off. And eastbound on the Gardner. It's a stall just at York Bay Young. It's the right lane and shoulder block fire arrived on scene. So that's just adding to the very busy afternoon. I'll send it back right. to you both. All right, Adjwa, thanks so much for this. Well, police have released footage of two suspects trying to carjack a woman in a Markham parking garage. So this is kind of crazy. Investigators say August 31st, around 8 o'clock that evening, the woman pulls into a parking garage into the area of Enterprise Boulevard and Birchmount Road. She was driving a silver Mercedes SUV and was followed by a white Honda Civic. Well, the suspects pulled into the space right beside her. They got out and demanded her keys. A struggle took place, and eventually they left without her car. The first suspect is described as male, black, with a thin build. Suspect number two is described as male, dark skin, with curly hair and a tattoo on his right forearm. Well, in other news, Halton police say they've disrupted a major auto theft ring that was based in Quebec, but stealing vehicles here in the GTA. Four people have been charged, and Canada-wide warrants have been issued for four others in relation to a criminal investigation and organization. Investigators say that the suspects, they would come to the GTA, steal high-end vehicles, and then ship them out of the country via the Port of Montreal. This case clearly demonstrates that when it comes to organized crime and making money, these offenders know no boundaries and will evolve their techniques to avoid detection. There needs to be, continue to be, a collective recognition that this is not just property crime. This is organized crime that is traumatizing and hurting people. It shakes our community's sense of safety, even more so as the sanctity of their homes is breached, with criminals increasingly willing to enter homes in pursuit of cars. We're advocating to the federal government for significant changes to uh, reduce effectively the uh, pipeline uh, 
um, for these stolen vehicles. Right now, we have a situation where uh, the Port of Montreal is effectively uh, open gates. Um, these cars can literally be driven uh, in their in their various uh, sea containers onto the port and onto a ship and into other countries and being sold within a few days. That has to stop. There needs to be more technology applied uh, at the Port of Montreal to ex examine the contents of sea containers that are arriving at the port uh, and effectively arresting uh, the individuals that are transporting them. Police say a unique method was used to transport the stolen vehicles to Montreal. They were put in a modified RV trailer that looked like a regular camper from the outside as it was towed along the 401 to Quebec. Early on in the investigation, we identified an area that a lot of the stolen vehicles were being transported to in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. And uh, with reviewing video surveillance, we quickly learned that the vehicles were actually physically being driven into this trailer and then transported to uh, the Port of Montreal. At least 40 vehicles were stolen, but only about a dozen have been recovered. It is now 538, 22 degrees. You're watching Live at 5. And coming up, a new survey finds that Canadians are not comfortable with increasing requests for tips. We'll have reaction from Toronto residents next. Okay, so serious question. Do you think that tipping, tipping culture is out of control? I think a lot of people would say it is. And a new survey reveals many Canadians agree with that statement. For more on this, let's go live to CP24's Kayla Williams, who's been talking to Torontonians about their attitudes when it comes mm -hmm. to leaving gratuity. You've had some interesting responses, Kayla. Oh, yeah. Lena and Bakari, I've talked to a lot of people today, guys, and I can tell you that the overall consensus from people I've had a chance to speak with is that they do feel it has gotten a bit excessive, especially here in the city of Toronto. A lot of people also noted, too, that due to the pandemic a few years back, there was that increase and that willingness to, you know, give a little extra. But now that we are where we are, and of course, a lot of people are on budgets and the economy is what it is here in Ontario, a lot of people are, you know, it's it's a bit of a sticking point when it comes to conversation. And that is exactly why this survey was done by the narrative research. And so the initial point was what services are deemable or are, are deemed as one that deserves a tip. And of course, 77 percent of the Canadians with this survey said that, yes, dining out, going on a patio, having a meal to eat at a restaurant absolutely is. So same goes for salons such as hair and nails. 60 percent said you should tip as well as hotel housekeeping at 49 percent and taxi cabs at 48. But all the way down at just 19 percent was takeout from a restaurant. So we're talking about fast food joints or perhaps grabbing a quick coffee or a muffin at a local store. Now here at Liberty Village, I had a chance to speak with folks getting their opinion on tipping culture or tip place if you'd like to call it. Here's what they had to say. People shouldn't have to rely on tips for their wages. Employers should pay their staff so that they can afford to live without tips and they should be like an added bonus. Whereas I think realistically in Toronto, you could, like without your tips, it would be really difficult to survive on minimum wage. So I think it more sort of burden should be put on employers. The reason it was set as a percentage is because it goes up with inflation, right? Like you don't have to change the percentage for it to still represent a fair amount of the actual price of the food. Um, so I think we're kind of, we've got this inflation mindset that we need to, the percentage needs to go up, but the prices are also going up. So I just, it feels a little ridiculous. Yeah, and so when we're talking about, okay, if we are going to die now, we're going to have enjoy ourselves a nice meal outside, just how much should we tip? And a lot of people may notice that when you're, when you're handed the machine, nowadays you're seeing it at 18%, even as high as 25, if not more. But I can tell you that this, the results of this survey, Lena and Bakari, are showing that 53% of Canadians, they're still tipping at 15%. So 53% of Canadians tipping at 15%. Kayla, mm -hmm. when you were a server, what was the average percentage that you got? Was it 20%, 18%? How long ago oh, was gosh, that, first no, of all? No, I'm, I'm dating myself here. Right, okay, we're going back to my university days okay. and my high school days here. So this is like 2006. So I was happy with 
10, 12. Yeah. 12 was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, things have really now changed, like, yes. right? I remember when 15% was the normal, okay. and now it's like even 18% yeah. is considered an okay tip. So things have really changed. When I was valet parking cars, I'd get a dollar, exactly. two dollars, or sometimes you get five dollars from the big spender. That was a like, good okay. day. I just yeah, think he's aging himself, but. <laughs> okay, that, we're going to end it right here. Thanks a lot, Kayla. CB24 is Thanks, Kayla. Kayla Williams. Well, the jackpot for the next Lotto Max draw will be the largest prize in Canadian lottery history. This would be a massive tip. $75 million is going to be on the line in Friday's draw. This is after the cap for the main jackpot was increased. So if no one wins, it's going to climb to the maximum of $80 million. That'll be for the Tuesday draw. The OLG says that the odds of winning the jackpot are roughly 1 in 33 million. There's still a chance. There sure is. <laughs> well, let's talk about housing now. The GTA condo market is oversupplied and will likely take a while to balance out. Those are the findings of a new report by a TD economist out today. Let's go live to cp 24s Phil Perkins, who's in the Canary District neighborhood, for a closer look at this. Phil. Hey there, Bakari and Lena. Yeah, if you're watching this, you're probably wondering, what's the Canary District? That's actually one of the newer uh, neighborhoods here in the city of Toronto. It's in the east end, just north of what will be the Portlands, just north of the Gardner Express. And you can see there's a lot of new condos here, lots of to be completed condos here in the area. It's a, it's a mixed use place. They have YMCA, they got businesses, they got colleges as well. Of course, they have a lots of condos. And so as we're People who are keeping track of the Bank of Canada and their interest rates drops. So they've been doing three in a row now. Many people thought that, you know, with these in, uh, these decreases in interest rates, there'll be more and more people able to afford some of these condos here that might be on sale. But that just doesn't seem to be the case because while interest rates are going down, thus making them a little bit more affordable, there's also more new builds that are completed and now are open for purchase. And so what we are finding is people are now still interest rates are still quite high so they're not able to afford them so a lot of these finished condos are still sitting empty no one is purchasing purchasing them this according to a td economist says that sales activity hasn't been absorbing supply that increased supply we're just talking about quickly enough with gta condo resales in july down 25 percent from pre-pandemic levels and so we're going to be talking to people here in the canary district and asking them you know are, are they on the fence are they sitting on the sidelines right now are they waiting for interest rates to go down because right now if you were to talk to a real estate agent you're kind of in a buyer's market uh, because there is a lot more supply not as much demand and you can maybe save yourself a couple thousand dollars we're going to try to speak to some people here and see how the situation has been for them lena bakari back all to right you. keep us posted on those conversations phil thanks so much for this it's 5 46 22 degrees you're watching live at five. Well, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says that he cannot wait to get back to Ottawa to get into it with Pierre Poilievre. We're going to have more on his comments on the final day of the Liberal Caucus retreat. That's coming up. Liberal MPs are putting up a united front on the final day of their retreat in British Columbia. Yeah, the gathering is an opportunity for caucus members to voice how they think the party can improve before returning to Ottawa for the fall sitting in Parliament. So the retreat was the first chance for Liberals to gather as a group since they lost a long-held seat in Toronto to the Conservatives. Well, Prime Minister Trudeau called out Conservative leader Pierre Polyev during the Liberal caucus retreat in Nanaimo, B.C., we have the strongest macro balance sheet in the G7. We believe in putting that in service of Canadians by investing in them. And the answer the Conservatives are bringing forward is, oh no, we'll create growth and opportunities through cutting programs Canadians are relying on. That's the choice that people get to make in these upcoming by-elections. That's the choice people are going to make next year. And I can't wait to continue getting into it this fall. And Conservative leader Pierre Polyev spoke to reporters in Ottawa today. He reacted to the appointment of former Bank of Canada governor as a special advisor to the Liberals. Take a listen to that. My message to carbon tax Carney is come in from out of the shadows. We don't need a phantom finance minister. If you are going to be pulling the strings, you should be on the floor of the House of Commons with your massive financial interests and your foreign interests disclosed to Canadians. 
Stop pushing to kill Canadian jobs while you ship the jobs abroad. Make your carbon tax agenda known and be held accountable for Canadians so that we can choose in the carbon tax election. And when we do, common sense conservatives will bring home the country we know and love. NDP leader Doug Meet Singh responded to Poliev in Montreal. This is where his party caucus has been meeting. This is ahead of the return to Parliament. So Singh says that he will not be listening to advice from Poliev. They like to make things about petty insults and make things about attacking people personally. You see, what I do is I attack what he's going to do to Canadians. I'm concerned that Pierre Polyev's vision of Canada is to tear down our health care system. And so I attack him on the policy that he's going to hurt Canadians by tearing down our health care system. And so you're going to have to pay out of pocket to the care you need. I think that is horrible. I think that's bad. But I attack him on his policies, on his bad decisions, on his track record. He likes to insult people and call people names. I think that shows you what type of person he is. And that's going to be an important part of the decision Canadians make in the next election. Now, while Singh rejects the idea of ever listening to Pierre Polyev, he did not say how the NDP would vote on a non-confidence motion, repeating they'll look at any vote and make a decision. It's 5.52, 22 degrees. This is Live at 5. Stolen in Ottawa, found in Italy. Just ahead, police solved the theft of a famous portrait of Winston Churchill. Stay with us for that story. Liberal MPs are putting up a united front on the final day of their retreat in British Columbia. Yeah, the gathering is an opportunity for caucus members to voice how they think the party can improve before returning to Ottawa for the fall sitting in Parliament. So the retreat was the first chance for Liberals to gather as a group since they lost a long-held seat in Toronto to the Conservatives. When Prime Minister Trudeau called out Conservative leader Pierre Polyev during the Liberal caucus retreat in Nanaimo, B.C., we have the strongest macro balance sheet in the G7. We believe in putting that in service of Canadians by investing in them. And the answer the Conservatives are bringing forward is, oh no, we'll create growth and opportunities through cutting programs Canadians are relying on. That's the choice that people get to make in these upcoming by-elections. That's the choice people are going to make next year. And I can't wait to continue getting into it this fall. And Conservative leader Pierre Polyev spoke to reporters in Ottawa today. He reacted to the appointment of former Bank of Canada governor as a special advisor to the Liberals. Take a listen to that. My message to carbon tax Carney is come in from out of the shadows. We don't need a phantom finance minister. If you are going to be pulling the strings, you should be on the floor of the House of Commons with your massive financial interests and your foreign interests disclosed to Canadians. Stop pushing to kill Canadian jobs while you ship the jobs abroad. Make your carbon tax agenda known and be held accountable for Canadians so that we can choose in the carbon tax election. And when we do, common sense conservatives will bring home the country we know and love. NDP leader Doug Meet Singh responded to Poliev in Montreal. This is where his party caucus has been meeting. This is ahead of the return to Parliament. So Singh says that he will not be listening to advice from Poliev. They like to make things about petty insults and make things about attacking people personally. You see, what I do is I attack what he's going to do to Canadians. I'm concerned that Pierre Polyev's vision of Canada is to tear down our health care system. And so I attack him on the policy that he's going to hurt Canadians by tearing down our health care system. And so you're going to have to pay out of pocket to the care you need. I think that is horrible. I think that's bad. But I attack him on his policies, on his bad decisions, on his track record. He likes to insult people and call people names. I think that shows you what type of person he is. And that's going to be an important part of the decision Canadians make in the next election. Now, while Singh rejects the idea of ever listening to Pierre Polyev, he did not say how the NDP would vote on a non-confidence motion, repeating they'll look at any vote and make a decision. It's 5.52, 22 degrees. This is Live at 5. Stolen in Ottawa, found in Italy. Just ahead, police solved the theft of a famous portrait of Winston Churchill. Stay with us for that story.
Well, the mystery around the theft of a famous portrait of British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill from the lobby of an Ottawa hotel has finally been solved. Let's turn to CB24's Lindsay Biscay for more on this. Who done it? I know it sounds kind of cool, you know, tongue in cheek, but this is actually pretty serious. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is an incredibly famous photograph of Winston Churchill, one of the most famous, taken by a famous photographer. That is Ottawa's uh, Yusuf Karsh back in 1941 when Churchill came to Canada during wartime for a visit. Uh, so there's a picture of it right now. This is actually incredibly important. It is a fascinating sequence of events, though, and a happy ending because we know now that this real photograph has been found. It went missing from a hotel in Ottawa, the Fairmont Chateau Laurier, sometime between the end of 2021 and 2022. And then staff noticed that it had been replaced with a fake. And Ottawa police coming out today saying they managed to track down the real photograph in Italy. So they say it was sold through an auction house in London to uh, a private buyer in Italy. And both the auction house and this private buyer are just as much a victim as the hotel. That's what police said today because they had no idea that this was a stolen photograph at the time that it was uh, sold to this private buyer. So we did hear from Ottawa police today a little bit more about their investigation here's more work very closely um, at different steps with the London Metropolitan Police um, and with the Carbonari the London Metropolitan Police were um, effectively our, our right hand in getting a lot of the information that was required about uh, that we required to uh, to identify the subject so this is the Roaring Lion, as it's known, this photograph once again. And we know now that a man uh, has been arrested, Bakari and Lena, a 43-year-old man from Powassan, Ontario, although his name is under a publication ban. Police didn't say why his name is under a publication ban, but he's facing a number of charges, including theft over $5,000 and trafficking and property obtained by crime exceeding $5,000. And we're waiting now for this photograph to be returned to the hotel, which it will be. Back to you. Wow, what uh, a dramatic turn of events. Lindsay Biscaya reporting live our newsroom tonight. Thank you, Lindsay. Well, a Soyuz spacecraft carrying two Russians and an American has blasted off to the International Space Station. Engines are at maximum thrust, booster ignition not full throttle, and we have liftoff of Pettit, Ochinin. The capsule launched from Kazakhstan and is scheduled to dock at the ISS at some point today. In contrast, is the missions that last for days. The blast took off without any obvious problems and it entered orbit eight minutes later. Well, Taylor Swift could make MTV VMA history tonight. Swift is nominated for 12 awards. That's mostly for her Fortnite music video. If she collects eight trophies, she'll become the most awarded musician in VMA's history. That's one ahead of current record holder Beyonce. The VMAs will be hosted by Megan Thee Stallion with performances from Eminem, Lenny Kravitz, Shawn Mendes, and Camila Cabello. And people watching the VMAs tonight will have the opportunity to shop the outfits they see on the screen. A new partnership between Paramount Global and ShopSense AI features a new lens that allows viewers to take photos of the looks they like and then be directed to websites where they can buy similar items online. It aims to give retailers a boost and help media companies monetize their content. Well, the leaves have signed for Max Pacioretty to a professional tryout. The 35-year-old appeared in 47 games with the Washington Capitals last season, recording four goals and 19 assists. He returned to action after recovering from a second tear in his Achilles that saw him play just five games in the 2022-23 campaign. Pacioretty's agent says that he expects his client to sign a deal with Toronto before the start of the season. 559, 22 degrees. This is Toronto's breaking news, CP24. Thank you for watching. CTV News at 6 is next.